We have been looking at uh, doing a wee series on living differently as part of Jesus' upside-down kingdom. And uh, today, I'm going to continue that, and we're going to look at having a servant heart. We looked at prayer, we looked last week at fasting, and today I want to look briefly at what the Bible has to say to us about having a servant heart. We're going to look at John chapter 13. Um, At John chapter 13 to 17, we have the longest single slug of teaching from Jesus that we read anywhere in the Bible, John 13 through to 17, as he prepares his disciples for the fact that he's going to be going away, that they're not going to be, he's not going to be physically with them anymore. Um, And in John chapter 13, at the start of this section, we have a well-known passage, but I think we should read it again this morning. Uh, I'm sure uh, most of us, if not all of us, will know it well from having read it before. It's where Jesus washes his disciples' feet. But let's just read it together this morning and see if my doofer works. Nope. Where's Jane? (laughs) How are we doing? How are we doing? Is on up or down? It's up. (laughs) A. There you go. It's too small. You can't read it anyway. So it would be a good idea to get your Bible out if you have one. John 13, this is what it says. It was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and to go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed the full extent of his love. The evening meal was being served and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel round his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash your feet, you have no part with me. Then, Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, a person who has a bath needs only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that was why he said not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, He put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. I tell you the truth, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Amen. So I want us to look this morning at, it's a a well-known passage, but there is a lot in it, and we could spend a long time in it. We could spend several Sundays in it, but we're not going to do that. I just want us to look at three specific things that lead us towards thinking about 
our service, what service means, and how we serve each other. And those three things are unconditional love, upside-down greatness, and selfish service. And in each case, what we see from this passage is the difference between the world's view of things and Jesus' view of things. And that hopefully will help us to think about how we as Jesus followers live differently in our world today. Firstly then, unconditional love. We read in verse 1 that Jesus had come from the Father and the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Jesus Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. Some translations you might have say he loved them to the end. He loved them and showed them and intended to show them the full extent of his love. It's very easy to love. It's very easy to care for people. It's very easy to show an interest in people when everything is all right with you. But when things are hard, it's not so easy. Jesus was literally kind of days before he was due to be taken and crucified. He knew what lay ahead of him. And yet in that moment of pain, of anxiety, of pressure, in that moment, his concern was for his disciples. His thought was for his disciples. His love was still with his disciples. He loved them from the beginning. He loved them to the end. And what he was thinking about was showing them the extent of his love. That's unconditional love. But also here we see that the way he shows his love, his unconditional love to them is he gets down and washes their feet. Now, we know you must have heard it several times over in, in sermons. They all, the roads were dusty, they all wore sandals. It was standard thing that when you came into a meal and before you reclined at table, you would, a servant would wash your feet. A slave, usually if you had any slaves, a slave would wash your feet. But nobody had done it. The disciples had come in with Jesus and probably everyone had thought, it's not my job. <laughs> yeah. um, well, someone else can do it. And nobody had done it. So rather than somebody doing it, nobody had done it. So they're sitting there with dirty feet. And that's when Jesus gets up and decides to take his outer garments off, get a towel, and actually wash their feet. Notice here that he doesn't wash their feet because they are worthy. They're not worth it. He washes G Judas's feet. Well, w the Bible doesn't tell us that he didn't wash Judas's feet, okay? Let's get it. Let's get it. So he appears to wash Judas's feet. He doesn't come to Judas and say, I'm not washing your feet, mate, because I know what you're doing. He doesn't do that. He washes the feet of the person that he know, knows is plotting to have him killed. He washes Peter's feet. Peter, the one who he knows is going to uh, deny him, deny him three times. In fact, all of the disciples are going to abandon him. They're going to run away. They're going to hide. They're going to pretend they had nothing to do with him in a very short period of time. And yet, he washes the feet of all of these people. even though we might think they're not worthy of having their feet washed. It's hard to love when you don't get anything back. You know, and sometimes that feeling, that experience in people's lives is such that they find it hard to go on in a relationship. You know, if you're in a friendship and you get nothing back, it's kind of hard, you know, the easy thing to do is really to, you know, oh, well, 
I'm not going to try anymore. Um, and we can do that in our church lives. Some people have that experience in a marriage, obviously. You know, sometimes there's very, very good reasons for marriages coming to an end. But, you know, it's hard. It's just hard in our human experience to keep loving unconditionally when we get nothing back. But that's not the case with Jesus. Jesus loves us unconditionally, even though none of us deserve it. Irrespective of who we are, where we are, what we've done, Jesus loves us unconditionally. And that's what he was demonstrating to his disciples here. He loves us because he loves us, not because of anything we have done. He doesn't love us because we're worthy, but because he's worthy. He doesn't love us because we're great. He loves us because he's great. His love is not a function of our holiness or our goodness. It's because of his holiness and his goodness. So he loves us and he loves his disciples here unconditionally. And that leads us on to the second thing we can see here. Jesus different, living differently, different from the world. Jesus different view of greatness. John 13 and Luke 22 go together. You can't really understand what's going on here unless you read Luke 22, Luke chapter 22, along with John 13. Um, Luke 22 doesn't tell us anything about the foot washing, but John 13 doesn't tell us anything about what we read in, in Luke 22, which was that the disciples were having a dispute. They were deciding who was the greatest, you know, important in, uh, in Jesus' kingdom when Jesus' kingdom came, you know. Who's going to have the biggest office? You know, who's going to be number one? Who is definitely not going to do any foot washing? That's what the disciples had been talking about at this meal before we get to the point where we just read about Jesus washing their feet. Because they were carried along. They, they'd been involved with Jesus in the ministry. They'd seen great things happening, miraculous things happening. Can I they couldn't help but think, you know, they were maybe important. In fact, in Luke, you also read that they said to Jesus, oh, wait a minute, some people have been doing these miraculous things in your name, and they're not part of us. Tell them to stop it. They were so taken with their status and who they were, rather than um, <clears throat> realizing that it was all to do with Jesus. So they'd had this dispute, and that's when Jesus says, he washes their feet and tells them what he's doing. And he both does something there and then, which needed done that nobody had done, and kind of embarrasses them all, really, because they realize, oops, and Peter certainly realized, what's Jesus doing washing my feet? Well, maybe you should have started washing someone else's feet first. Um, and he also, it's also symbolic, isn't it? We know this. It's symbolic of what he is about to do as he gives his life for the world and dies and defeats death for us. The ultimate act, selfless act. You see, in the world's terms, greatness is, you know, the number of people that serve you. But in Jesus' kingdom... It's the number of people you serve. He was about to give up his power and position. We read there, and we mentioned it there, reading verse 3, that um, he knew that God, the Father, had put all things, he had given him power over all things. Power over all things. Jesus didn't need to get a basin of water out and wash their feet. Jesus could have made their feet clean there and then. He could have done another, another miracle, you know? He, all, he had power over all things, but he chooses not to do that. He chooses instead to, in a simple, physical way, demonstrate love by washing their feet. Notice as well it says, so. 
He's, he's talking, John is writing down there, but Jesus knowing he's come from the Father and he's returning to the Father. Jesus' teaching is all about being him being the Messiah, the Son of God. Um, he's very clear in all that. So that we read those verses and then so he then goes to show them the extent of his love. The two are linked. You know, as human beings, we would find it very difficult to know we have some status and then to deliberately do the opposite. And yet that's what Jesus does here. He is the all-powerful one, and yet he chooses to get down on his knees and to serve. We read about the disciples falling out about who's going to be the greatest as well in Mark, Mark chapter 9, where Jesus is quoted as saying, if anyone wants to be the first, he must be the very last and the servant of all. And then we have recorded in John there, the words we read and, and are up on the slide there, where he similarly tells them uh, that they should be seeking to serve. In Luke chapter 22, he says, I am among you as one who serves. That's a very clear indication of Jesus' different view of greatness. Uh, in Philippians chapter 2, we read well-known verses about Jesus, and we'll look at them again in a minute. But there it says that he was exalted to the highest place. Why? Because he descended to the depths for us. Uh, Tim Keller summarizes it like this. The Christian view of greatness should be that the way up is down. The way to influence and power is to serve. The way to happiness is not to care about our own happiness, but to seek the happiness of others. I like this guy. This is Shane, Shane Claiborne. I don't know if you've ever read any of his stuff. I know David, uh, David has, um, because he, when he was speaking uh, recently, he mentioned it. And this is now quite an old book. He's, he's, he, he's written an awful lot of other books since then, but... Um, this is the irresistible revolution, living as, as an ordinary radical, and it's a challenging book to read. But he, he deals with this idea of the world's greatness and greatness in the kingdom of God. Let me just read you these words. We have a God who enters the world through smallness, a baby refugee, a homeless rabbi, the lilies and the sparrows. We have a God who values the little offering of a couple of coins from a widow over the mega charity of millionaires. We have a God who speaks through little people, a stuttering spokesman named Moses, the stubborn donkey of Balaam, a lying brothel owner named Rahab, an adulterous king named David, a ragtag bunch of disciples who betrayed, doubted, and denied, and a converted terrorist named Paul. And then we have those, that quote there. It's easy to fall in love, and this is, for, this is particularly aimed at people like us in a Christian church family, where we have aspirations to grow our church, and rightly so. It's what we're called to do, go into the world and preach the gospel and see people come to faith in Jesus. So nothing wrong with wanting to see our church grow. It's a core part of, of what we seek to do in the church here. But we do have this warning. It's easy for us to fall in love with great things. We can easily become so driven by our vision for church growth, community, or social justice that we forget the little things like caring for those round about us. At this point, I think it is important for us to remember that Christians do not have a monopoly on serving other people. And some of us were just talking about that earlier on. In fact, some people out with the Christian church, some people of no faith at all, put us to shame by the degree to which they are willing to serve other people for no reward. God works in spite of us a lot of the time rather than because of us or through us. And I have no doubt that God 
works through people who do not acknowledge him as their Savior and Lord. And we just have to come to terms with that and realize that and, and accept that as a challenge that we who understand and are recipients of that un, un, unconditional love understand what it is to turn greatness on its head, to be willing to do the servant's job, to do the menial things, to do the simple things, the unseen things to serve others. Clearly, you know, things like street pastors and city mission and what Esther is now seeking to do with Aruka, these are all clear examples of where Christians can and do uh, seek to do the foot washing of our day. And, you know, we should continue to support as we do as a church, support them and pray for them as they do that. Finally, when we understand the unconditional love of Jesus for us, when we realize that he has turned ideas, the world's ideas of greatness on their head, where should that lead us to? That should lead us to a, living a different life, living life differently by committing ourselves to selfless service. And, you know, I'm uncomfortable standing here talking about this this morning because I'm instantly judged myself. I'm, you know, first hypocrite, hand up as to how much I give myself to selfless serving of other people. We have here in John 13, we have Jesus' example to follow. And then in Philippians chapter 2, we have mention of his attitude of service. His example being willing to serve I've set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. And then at the end, he says, now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. You know, it wasn't Jesus' problem that people hadn't washed their feet. You know, he could easily have said, not my job. He could easily have said, someone else can do it. But even though it was nothing to do with him, it wasn't his problem, it wasn't his place, to do so, he was willing to do it. He was willing to get down on his hands and knees. And he gave us an example. As I've washed your feet, you should be willing to wash other people's feet. Now, as you, there are some Christian traditions where that is still taken literally and where people will do that as a mark of humility, will be willing to do that. I'm not suggesting we do that, but maybe we should. Maybe sometimes we should just to physically, practically demonstrate our commitment to one another and our willingness to serve, we should do something like that. But certainly there will be other ways in which we can effectively wash each other's feet and follow Jesus' example. And then in Philippians 2, these are great words. Is it enough to follow Jesus' example? It's important, yes. But it's also important that in so doing, our attitude is like Jesus, that your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant. Another wee book that's worth reading on this is Richard Foster's, and appropriate for Lent time, obviously, Richard Foster's Celebration of Discipline, and he goes into quite some detail over ideas of Christian ideas of service. And he points out that actually it's possible to serve, to do the serving, to do the foot washing, but for, it, for us to be a bit self-righteous in doing it, rather than being humble as Jesus was. You know, the, the, the self-righteous server will, will serve others, but it will be human effort rather than being divinely prompted and inspired. It's possible for us to like doing the big things, the, showy, the public things, the things that people will appreciate rather than the small actions that maybe aren't seen and people don't know about. If we're honest, it's... Sometimes we like the respect and the reward for doing good things. 
whereas Jesus' model is to be content for our works and our serving to be hidden. Richard Foster goes on to make a, a distinction, and it's worth reading it if you, ha- if you have the book to read it again, between serving and being a servant. And the key thing he points out is that choosing, if we choose to serve, we're still effectively in charge. We can still choose when we serve, who we serve, how we serve. But if we choose to be a servant, as Jesus did, to become a servant, we give up the right to be in charge. That's insanely difficult, isn't it? Which one of us could honestly put a hand up and say, I'm willing to give up the right to be in charge and to decide how I serve because basically that's what my Lord has done for me and demonstrated in his unconditional love for me. You've got to really, haven't you, Mother Teresa? She's the ideal example. These well-known words of hers challenge us, I think. We can do not great things, only small things with great love. It is not how much we do, but how much love we put into it. I saw this quote from um, John Stott as well, Bible teacher, in one of his books saying, we are sent into the world like Jesus to serve, for this is the natural expression of our love for our neighbors. We love, we go, we serve. So, where does that lead us this morning? And hopefully we can see that. I want to just leave you with a few questions this morning to think about. Firstly, do I love unconditionally or do I expect something back? As we said earlier, it's very difficult to keep giving and giving and giving in a loving relationship if we don't get anything back. But Jesus got nothing back. We don't read the disciples saying, no, 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 I'll wash. (laughs) Please, please, I'll do the foot washing. Nothing. Only Peter who kind of didn't get it and argued the toss with him. So are we willing to keep loving unconditionally, even if we get nothing back? Do I show love and respect to those who oppose me? If we were Jesus and we knew what Judas was about to do, would we wash his feet? And Peter and the others who were going to abandon him, would he not feel like saying something? In fact, later on, Jesus does challenge Judas about what he's going to do and says, go and do it and do it quickly. So he knows about it, but in that moment, he chooses to demonstrate an act of service and love, even to people that were opposed to him. I'm challenged by that, I must confess. Am I signed up to the world's model of greatness or the upside down Jesus model? And what motivates me to serve others in all areas of my life? Motivation might be different in different areas of our lives as individuals, but also when we come together as a church family, what motivates us? And we've got to be honest with ourselves. Sometimes, particularly if, if we feel undervalued and we feel people haven't appreciated the service we have offered, it's very difficult not to expect it to be acknowledged or to desire some kind of acknowledgement for what we've done. But that's not Jesus' model. Living differently is doing as he did, quietly getting down on our knees and serving and not expecting any acknowledgement or any reward for that. And am I both following Jesus' example and displaying his attitudes in how and when and who I serve? Dave's just going to come and lead us in communion. But just before he does, let me read those verses again from Philippians chapter 2, because they're appropriate to what we've been thinking about this morning, but also to what we're going to do now as we take communion together. Our attitude should be that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing 
taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Father, we thank you for your word again this morning. Uh, we confess we're challenged quite often by the simplest and most straightforward parts of your word, challenged as to wh- how differently we live our lives in our world today, whether we tend to fall in with the world's ideas or whether we always fix our eyes on Jesus and follow him and seek to live our lives the way he asked us to. Help us to think about these things this morning. Help us to be willing servants, to serve each other, to serve the world around us. Yes, and even to serve those who oppose us. Help us to know what all that means and help us to put it into practice, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.